So here, here for instance, is a good example. Here is uh, blood urea nitrogen, and I've got fully 10 years uh, of it. Um, and, you know, like the liver enzymes, for instance, AST, ALT, and then, um, you know, uh, I've got uh, ALK as well, somewhere around here. And, um, and then, um, uh, so, so we can take and make subsets, like here's fasting glucose, you know, I've had for 10 years. The other stuff is like the HDL sub, this is only when I started doing full VAPs, and, and, but these are now the sub HDL, and then I've got, of course, all the four H LDLs as well to look for the ones that are small and make you, you know, create your plaque and that sort of stuff. Things like potassium, a lot of the electrolytes. Um, now things like a lysosome. this is both blood and stool. So here is lysozyme, which is from the stool sample, which is the uh, point defense uh, uh, innate uh, part of your immune system and um, so forth. So what we can do is take subsets of these and we're just gonna look at one to start with, which is the immune system. So let's do the big four. Um, now, in case you think we know what we're doing, this is a voyage of discovery, right? So that what we're trying to do is, uh, this is much more, as far as I can see, than anything in the medical literature, particularly regarding um, uh, IBD, in the sense that the, the time resolution and the duration is, is more than anything, at least if you have other articles, I'd love to, because I've never seen any out of 400 or so I've looked at. Um, so here now what we're doing is, this is, uh, I, I started, I had a major event in um, 2000, October 2008. Yeah, I uh, want to talk to you about that. Yeah, actually. okay. Because you did send us some data, mm -hmm. okay, and it was obvious, like, you know, LZL, if I'm not mistaken, actually, you know, changed drastically. That so was starting see. taking a statin. So, and then you have, uh, so you have antibiotics in September, right? Mm -hmm. And and then nothing else, just antibiotics? Mm -hmm. Because it's 10 days, case, right? That's kind of, you know, it's great and crazy, right? I mean, you know, you have antibiotics, it reflects to, you know, influences so many different things, right? Right, oh, and, absolutely. yeah, so what we don't know is what caused what. So for instance, um, I don't suppose you can pull up LDL. Let's see if we can do this. Um, there's an interesting hypothesis, which is what set off, as we'll see, the first wave of these uh, autoimmune attacks. And um, the hypothesis is that I came from my um, uh, uh, microbial um, professor at Irvine that I've been working with. Uh, she pointed out that I started taking the statin in the summer of 08 and that caused a drastic drop in cholesterol of LDL, let's put it that way. Um, and it was um, basically Crestor and that the microbes actually need cholesterol. And so um, it could have led to a major change in the ecology of species of the microbiome to have that drastic a thing. And then the attack is October and, and the growing CRP is, you can see the CRP, okay, um, Right. Um, yeah. So what you can see here is this the LDL was basically constant until this moment here. Can you touch that one? This here? Yeah. So, um, so I was at 93 in uh, June. Okay. And then go down to the next one. So, but August, I'm down to 60. Right? And if you go up here, you can see that the CRP in um, uh, there was uh, about 12 in June, and then it jumped up to about 15 very quickly uh, in September. 
Uh, and that was one month before I had this acute attack of what they said was diverticulitis, but I'm sure was not, was the beginnings of a Crohn's attack. Um, and, then, and then there's only about 10 days in here that I had the antibiotics, because later on what we'll see is I had a full month. Um, however, um, uh, most of this drop is not, I mean, the antibiotics is only a portion of this, mm -hmm. like that much, because this is what? What date is this? October 20th, and this is September 4th. So actually, it was something like this much antibiotics. And my natural immune system had dropped most of the way before I took the antibiotics, not that the doctors would know. Um, but then right after that, if you look at um, uh, lysozyme, the lysozyme takes off. I mean, this is actually the secretory IgA. It takes off. So this is the adaptive part of the immune system. But in the meantime, the CRP has dropped low, right? So it's like what, we, what I will show you is that the inflammation in your blood is, is not tightly coupled to the innate and adaptive immune system, that they're, they are out of phase in a, in, every time you look at it. The other thing that's sort of interesting is you can see here that the um, uh, lysozyme uh, was, which is the point defense in the colon wall, it bores holes in the walls of gram-positive bacteria, um, was up while the adaptive part was down. And I'm not doing it finely enough in time back then um, uh, that by the time this goes up, this one is on the way down, right? So there is also a phasing there. Um, now, the way that we're currently doing the colors is if it's in green, it's in the normal range. If it's orange, it's one to ten times above the upper limit. If it's in red, it's ten to a hundred times the upper limit. And if it's in purple, it's over a hundred times the upper limit. Okay? Um, now, one of the things that um, I'm particularly fond of is, is this. Uh, first of all, the other thing is the doctors would never know this because uh, these three things come from stool test and they never ask for them. And if they do, like at UCSD, um, they'll, uh, they do lactoferrin and, they, and it comes back yes or no. Yeah. Idiotic, okay? when for the same exact money I get this complete analysis over the web where I FedEx off my stool that I cannot get at UCSD, the great research hospital. You know? So not that I'm not meeting with the group that sets the medical test for this place, right? But they move at a very slow pace. Um, okay, so what happened, oddly enough, is in uh, May of 11, I had this uh, really enormously high, and I was able to get a colonoscopy on the same date. So actually I have pictures from that, which was the first time that I began to understand that in six inches of my sigmoid, so that's important, it's on the left side, not the ilium, which is over here, um, I had these internal, um, they look just sort of like a wall bulges out, and they're called inflamed pseudopolyps. Um, uh, but then uh, in uh, about a year ago, um, my CRP started this very high um, growth. Again, I could never get any doctors to be interested in these. They just said they're academic, they're not useful, right? And they want to know, what do you feel like? As if that was more definitive than, than these. Um, now, the way I, I self-diagnosed myself as having uh, IBD was by the values of lactoferrin. So um, there are a bunch of journal articles that show that the uh, lactoferrin is a sensitive and specific test to differentiate uh, chronic incurable IBD from IBS or colitis or a bunch of other things, right? 
And if you actually look for patients that are, are scored by their um, symptoms, there's a scoring system for IBD for the severity of the attack, and you look at uh, the values of lactoferrin, then for the most severe attacks you get an IBD, it's at about 1,000, and this one is 1,000, 1,200, something like that. Andrew, can you? Sorry, am I in your way? Here. 899. So it wasn't just a little bit off, right? Um, now, in spite of that, my colonoscopist denied that I had it, um, and so I fired him. And, um, but then after that, it went back down and, you know, stayed down, but then the CRP started climbing. And so what you're getting at is, you know, what I'm trying to do is say, what is really going on in your body in the multi-component immune system, its interaction with the microbiome in a chronic situation? First, it's episodic, we knew that, but what's the phasing? What, and what, what physically is going on, right? Because actually, you know, I think we're going to be able to determine things at a pretty precise level. Lactoferrin. Lactoferrin has a, is an antibacterial because it sequesters iron. Now, it only works on microbes that require iron. It's only sent out if the body says, hey, the immune system says, this is, a, this is an entity that if you take the iron away, we're going to kill it, right? As compared with calprotecting, can we add that in? Um, uh, and in fact, yeah, you could take out the LDA, but don't worry about it. Just add it. So calprotectin is, I just had a talk with uh, the um, person who works under Sanborn, um, in the, he was head of GI here, and who's my doctor this morning. And I said, you know, you, you, you get both lactoferrin and calprotectin uh, tested on my stool now. Do you know the difference? She didn't. Okay. So what calprotectin does is it sequesters zinc and manganese. Okay. Now I learned this from my microbiology professor up at Irvine. If I wasn't doing Cal IT2 with two campuses, I would never know this stuff, right? Um, and so you can see the calprotectin, uh, which I only started once I got to be a patient with Sanborn, um, spikes here whereas the lactoferrin is relatively at a low level. So that means that the body said there's some zinc and manganese <laughs> eating microbes, and so who are those microbes, right? Or, for instance, when the lysozyme is in this dance, up and down, up and down, up and down, um, uh, it is only being sent out if they're gram-positive bacteria to get their, holes, their walls bored holes in, whereas a lot of this stuff is gram-negative, right? So that's not what it's for. So my hope is that by doing the inverse problem from the data, if you get enough data, you should be able to do an inverse problem to have a pretty good idea of what the dynamics really is, which would make all the difference in the world for a successful therapy and when to intervene and how much to intervene and what to target and so forth. So let's now add these uh, big four together. So another way to, to work at the phasing that Andrew worked up is to uh, actually normalize each of the curves to zero to one, right, uh, over their lifetime. And uh, this is four years, basically. And, um, and we've changed the coloring so that uh, you can look up here to find the color of the curve and then follow that curve. And you immediately see something that, again, uh, I didn't know, my doctors still aren't I think clear about, which is that there were these, there was a, a major episode, then there was a long set of remission, and then all hell broke loose. And um, you can see here, one of the things that I discovered only after Andrew had written this wonderful software, um, is look at these two points, okay, right here. So these two points, this is January, this is February. Okay, you can actually touch them, Andrew, and, and we'll know exactly when. So December 28th and uh, January 30th. So exactly one month apart. But notice what happened. In the blood, the inflammation, as measured by CRP, is an all-time high in red in January, and then it plummets, right, with no antibiotics, no intervention, no therapy, just the immune system 
doing its nonlinear dynamic thing. Okay? Whereas in January, or December 28th, the um, secretory IgA, which is the most common immunoglobulin in your body and an adaptive immune system agent, is almost zero, right? Zoom to its highest value ever, simultaneous with the lysozyme, the innate immune system, going into... So it's as if the body tried cooking this stuff by inflammation. That didn't work. <laughs> so then it pulls in the full immune system. The um, uh. Now we also have the white blood cell count and the neutrophils, which if you add them, you'll see both peak at exactly the January point, and the neutrophils stay peaked. And the reason that that's interesting is if you were to add calprotectin, you'd see it peaked exactly uh, at the same time in, in January and then dropped very rapidly. So now you're beginning to get pairs of these things or triples of these things that are there and a month later they're gone and this other thing is in place. So one thing that tells you is, as crazy as I am at taking all this data, I'm not taking it enough and then I should be doing it at least every two weeks because if we want to, as a physicist, I'm not smart enough to know what the natural time scale for a particular, if I'm doing, as I used to do, general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics for accretion onto a black hole or something, well, the magnetic field is doing something, the pressure waves are doing something, and each of them have a natural time scale. And you let the phenomenon tell you what the time scale is on which you have to resolve. And that's what you're beginning to get here. So I actually talked to Jeff Gordon at WashU uh, about this. I haven't shown him all the details uh, about a month ago. And, he, and, and I sent him the lysozyme, and he says, well, it's clear you need to be taking stool samples every, every two weeks. Now, you know, there will be some things even smaller than that, right? But this is just not understood, I think. To, to, it, it, you can't resolve the phenomenon if, if, if you don't go to this finer time scale. On the other hand, here is basically a two to four year time scale, right? So you're talking at least a hundred to one dynamic range in time scales if you want to capture the overall phenomena of what's going on in the body. And that's a, an, a result, basically, of, I mean, an output of this, of this study. So let me just stop there. And by the way, you can see when the lactoferrin was at its height, most of the rest of the stuff, other than the uh, innate immune system, was, you know, kind of low compared to its later values. So, so Larry, let me ask you this one. I mean, it's not going to be sexy. I can ask you questions. If yeah. Yeah. So like, um, you do it exactly the same time, at the same day, you know, before break, I'm just... Yes. You know. Yes. Yeah? Typically, I do it um, before breakfast, um, type, I try to, so it's a typically at the same time of day, um, and then I try to, I, in many cases, have timed it to be able to do the blood draw later that morning. So, for instance, at UCSD, when I do the calprotectin, I get a blood draw, and then I give them a stool sample at the clinic in the morning. And if it's fasting, and you know, I'm fasting and so forth. So I'm very careful about whether I need to be fasting or not. Based on my very, very thin unit experience, uh, when they tried to do, for me, like blood, saliva, and uh, uh, urine, okay? Mm -hmm. um, 20 minutes difference if I, for it's just already different, it's like different person. So, and then, question mark, do you think you can do it on weekly basis? My problem, I could do the stool on a week, I could do it on a daily basis, but the problem is, with the blood, is that my, um, I usually have great big bruises and, and under, you know, blood under my skin and everything yeah. because my veins are very hard to find. Even, I mean, I'm saying that across a dozen different people or 15 different people that have tried to take my blood. Some of them can hit it right on the first one. 
but they're very rare. So trying to do that every two weeks or even every day would, you know. Get a center line. Yeah, right. I'd have to have it embedded. Yeah, but I don't think you really want to stick it up every day. Yeah. I mean, when I, you know, that's like the blood load. Yeah. So when I did that, my iron disappeared. Well, my ferritin, I can tell you my ferritin has dropped by two thirds yeah, just for the amount of, and the only way you get, the only way the ferritin drops is you get blood. And I'm giving enough blood that I've, it's dropped by two thirds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then the uh, but I, these are all good points. My but you know what? Uh, what's amazing? This is amateur science, and yet it already is telling us a lot of things. Now, what I would love is to get a professional doctor who says wow, these are generating so many hypotheses, let's get a dozen of my patients, let's standardize a protocol, and then let's start, and then let's do 100, right? And I'm probably going to, that's going to happen this year is my guess. Now, you might have said, how did you feel? So I've also been, if we can add the symptoms in, I've been um, keeping a diary for about four years, daily uh, if there's any abnormalities, I note it. And so I've now uh, got four different um, symptoms that I'm able to track. Um, and uh, the first um, is, and for those of you who are going to freak out, now's the time to leave, uh, is rectal bleeding in the toilet. I mean, actually dark, you know, Red. And, I, and I grade each of these from one to five. Then um, a flare, um, you know, bloating, pain, gurgling, all of the stuff that goes with that. Um, feeling depressed, malaise, not being able to get out of bed, things like that. Um, and then uh, uh, colds or nasal congestion is a different sort of immune thing. And, and so Andrew has very nicely done this so that the intensity of the color is from one to five. And um, you, you know, you can see things like the um, most intense period of bleeding here was as I was taking the stool sample that measures the 125 times upper limit lactoferrin. Um, it's kind of a messy business, but anyway, but you can see that from a frequency point of view, um, and this is again, no, there's no protocol, <laughs> um, but you can see that the um, intensity, there, there's a lot of things that happen. So the one person who's actually done any of these charts is Sanborn in the literature. And he just does like lactoferrin, he'll just do one cycle. But then he has a little star and he says that the flare occurs after the peak in the lactoferrin. And this is in a poster paper he did in New Orleans. Well, if you look at this, Here's the, you know, CRP peaking up here and the symptoms peaking here. So we're not sure enough yet to, to look at this, but this is where, you know, I don't know, for instance, is there any statistical significance or not, right? And there's such a small amount of data. These are, by the way, divided into 52 windows per year. So I've decided to do it by a week. Yeah. Right? I mean, the major spike, right? And, you know, maybe we, we can do, I'm just making it up right now, maybe we can do um, differential, you know, and see how, you know, it <coughs> looks like it, it, there is major events happening on, on the top side. Mm -hmm. It's reflected in major follow up with blood and flare, obviously, right? And, and even this one is also kind of. Here? Yeah, this one too. It doesn't yeah, yeah, this one's directly. Mm -hmm. um, and and what I guess is that, so and you'll notice the other thing that's very interesting is the feelings like of malaise or, or something which is you know I have to admit um, uh, psychological and then the flares which are you know you know it when you're having them. Um, in fact, I just 
just now, uh, this went on into 2013, this last week, I had uh, a three on, on the flare side, which you know is the most I've had since back in here somewhere, um, even though the numbers are, are getting low. So which, which of these, what is your body doing? You know, it drives me nuts. I, you know, I'm having this very physical change in my body and there's no doctor that says, well, here's what's going on. Your immune system is doing this and such, you know, your microbes are doing this and everything else. That's leading to methane production or, you know, some sort of, I mean, there's no mechanistic, there's no thought that there should be a mechanistic from first principles explanation. And that's one of the things I'm really trying to move toward um, that comes from being a physicist. But you need an immunologist on the team, and they're the hardest ones I see to, to find. You know, someone that really, like the Allergies and, um, Institute over there, has um, a woman who's one of these NIH directors funded people. Um, and I'm going to go see Sheila Crow and uh, G GI, who's actually um, got so many. Anyway, let's go to the microbiome. Let's just start with. Um, why don't you start with me in December and a healthy person? Yeah. You know, in my experience in telemedicine, that's what I said to you, saying, actually, in my experience, the, the generalists that say in medicine are far more interested. Uh, let's go 200. They will track them. They're not looking at the issue of monthly, but they, they've been really put up in the screen and tell you the last four or five years. So. so So, what, oh, you've already switched it, Andrew. Cool. Um, nice work. So, um, this came from sending to the Venner Institute. I'm working with Karen Nelson, who's director of research there. She's in D.C., right? In, in, in Maryland. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, um, they sent, they, they sent, they, so this is 230 million Illumina short reads. So, the H, HMP is about, 100 million. So this is quite deep. And um, Wyzong then has taken this and this has all been, uh, uh, the human has been taken out. Uh, and and Wyzong, you want to tell him just briefly how you got to here algorithmically? Several thousand. And then for the healthy, what we did is uh, Weizong downloaded um, actually 150 uh, from the human microbiome of the raw, of the, of the reads themselves, and then put them through the same software pipeline as, as me, right? So they'd be apples to apples. And then we selected out of that 150, 30 maybe, 35 that were, because uh, as you know, mainly it's the bacteriotes and the firmicutes. These are by, organized by phyla, and these are logarithmic abundance. So this, each bar is on a log scale. 
Uh, and if you added all the bars up, you get one. So it, um, and you can see that in a healthy person, roughly um, something like 90% of the uh, species are in one of two phyla. Okay, firmicutes and bacteriotes, right? Um, However, the ratio of firmicutes to bacteriotes is, uh, which was shown in that uh, paper in Nature um, this summer, that uh, can go from like 30 to 70 percent, right? So what we wanted to do was to select out of that 150, 35 along that um, variation so that we would have spanned the uh, healthy range, right? And then we add, we're basically adding those. So, so then we do, think of it this way. You've got, say, a couple of thousand microbe species that we have the full or, or scaffold, almost complete genome of. So that's your rows in the spreadsheet. And then you've got um, 35 people, each of which that has the abundance of that species. Now what we do is a simple linear average so this represents an average human being rather than any particular human being, but it has been spread across the diversity that we now know is existing from the Human Microbiome Program. Well, this is me at that December 28th when my CRP was uh, 30, right, and my calprotectin was 2,500 instead of less than 50. Um, and you can see right away uh, that, and this is quite characteristic as we'll see, later in IBD, the bacteriotes have been wiped out to a large extent. So instead of being that, and by the way, what we're looking here is the top 200 most abundant microbe species. That's what you're looking at. Now we can instantly change it to 100 or 500 or whatever you want. Um, and we really, this is the other thing, statistics, we'd love to help you work with this on. So, um, you've got several thousand microbes, right? Well, this logarithm, it's on a log scale, right? So what you're seeing here is a power law fall off, right? Well, where, as you go down that power law, the signal to noise drops. Where should we not believe beyond that, right? And, and you could do a self-consistent statistics test, I would think, that would give you that. Um, and we don't have that. Um, so that would be a thing number one that, I mean, of all the things you could do right away, that, that would be the thing that would be most helpful. But in any case, there's two major effects we're gonna see here. One is that the number of species up to some of this cutoff of 200, right, is much fewer. And now let's look at the abundance of the most abundant microbe Okay, which is um, three-tenths of a percent for the most of uh, uh, and let's go down here for a healthy person, seven percent. So um, 20 times lower in absolute abundance and many fewer, just probably because the most abundant is that one, so it cuts off. So the bacteriotes, which are incredibly important to you as a healthy person, are just really, really reduced. On the other hand, the firmicutes uh, remain, um, you know, quite prevalent until you begin to look at who they are. So if you look here at the, um, this particular bug, this is one that is well known because it's involved in um, immune system and, and, and you know, healthy response and so forth. If you look at me, can you make it, Andrew, so we can tell, see where that is on me? Okay, so here it is. And um, it's at uh, a half a percent, and what is it down here? seven-tenths of a percent. So it's not reduced all that much, but it's not the number one. What's the number one? Okay, so Parvomonas uh, micra, and um, this is actually typically found in the oral 
cavity. But notice it's 14% of my microbes. Where does it appear down here? Here. 0 0.0001. thousand times. That's what we call serious dysbiosis. Okay? So the leading firmicute, so the so at first it looks like, well, the firmicute's not that bad off, the firmicutes are still there. But it's a completely different set of firmicutes, right? Then it gets more interesting. Whereas all that's left over here is three uh, phyla in a healthy person. Um, you'll notice here, um, I do have the first one. Uh, we can touch that, the V. Um, Veruchoma microbia. So, Veruchoma microbia. Okay, anyway, um, it's there and I also have it. Um, but, the next one is pro proteobacteria, which is where the famous E. coli lives. Okay, so that's 1.3% in a normal person, and it's 12%, so 10 times the total. But if you look at E. coli, so 10.5% E. coli, yeah, and in a normal person, 0 0.0006, so 150 times. Uh, and then, as we'll see in a minute, um, the actinobacteria, uh, which in me as a phylum is uh, 2%, uh, down here in a healthy person is uh, 0 0.0001, okay? Now, the actinobacteria, as we'll see, are characteristic of Crohn's. Um, but more dangerous is the fusobacteria. So let's do the Fusobacteria. Okay, Fusobacteria, go ahead and highlight it. 8% is Fusobacteria. How many in a healthy person? Oops, goose egg. It doesn't even make it in the top 200. And it's 8% of me. And so you look up Fusobacteria and you say, well, what are these guys? Oh, we know about those guys. We find them in colon cancer extracts from biopsies of people with colon cancer. So um, this is one of the main reasons I think that people with Crohn's end up getting colon cancer often. It's, it's not the Crohn's, it's the microbes. <laughs> and uh, so that was unpleasant to find out. But now, okay, so E, thank you, John. Guess what? These are the archae. So archaea is, of course, a whole third kingdom of life, you know. So you've got the bacteria, the archaea that Carl Woese discovered, right? And then you've got the metazoa, basically. And um, so you notice that 20% of mine are archaea. And again, it doesn't show up down to the 200th most abundant microbe in a healthy person. Now, okay, let's just for the fun of it uh, go to 500. And again, I have no idea if this statistically means anything, but just since we have the pixels, let's use them. Yeah, just for both. That's all right. This is, which one is this? Yeah, that's all right. There we go. Okay. Um, now let's do FUSO. So now you see that in the healthy person, they are there. Okay, down here. But, and again, how many percentage were we? I was 8%? Yeah. And for these, it's 0. 0.0004. Right? Okay. And then for the, uh, for, let's do the uh, Archie. So that's 20% for me. And, oops. <laughs> so at 500, they don't show up?
So, so what it is, so it is, it's 700, 750 times normal. Yeah. Yeah, 10 to the minus 5, right? Now, what are the archi? And John, since John is an archi fan, what are the archi? Well, there's the most common one, uh, uh, has its own Wikipedia entry, which is uh, the Methanobrevibacter smithy, and um, it's 18%, and it is a methanogen. methanogen. Now, a hypothesis as to what's going on here is how come I can have so many of them? There must be something in the environment that is good for them. Now, I'm not a microbiologist, but having read up on E. coli, one of the things it does is produces hydrogen. And one of the things that limits its growth is the E. coli don't do well in the presence of hydrogen. However, methanogens are little vacuum cleaners for hydrogen because CH4, you got to get the hydrogen from somewhere. So it looks like they made a little tight synergetic community where the E. coli are allowed to go up to 150 times because they're the you know, hydrogen is being eaten up by the methanogens. And the methanogens would explain some of the other problems, right? Because of the production of massive production of methane, 750 times more than a normal. You know, I mean, I'm sure you know, just to be on the safe side, that Nuna, this guy here, is Dorenstein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they have a couple papers, maybe more than a couple, when they look into you know, coexistence of di different microbes, huh. right? And they did it from mass spectrometry. Mm -hmm. you know, Proteomics, yeah. Proteomics. So, and it looks, you know, exactly along those lines of interrelationship. So it would be very reasonable to try right. with, with that. I'll talk with him. I, I've been in communication with him. You know, I can give you the exact name. Yep. Um, one second. Uh, yeah. Dorenstein. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could show me that. Uh, yes, can I you send, just send me the paper? Okay, that's a to do. Anyway, look, we could go on all day about this, but the but these are things. First of all, I absolutely knew nothing about microbes when I started this. All this is or anything else. This is all self-education by reading hundreds of scientific papers. But this just hasn't been available before. And in particular, even if it's been in the human microbiome, without this kind of wonderful software that Andrew wrote on this kind of wonderful wall that Tom built, um, you try doing this on your PC, right? And be able to walk up and read the names. You know, uh, if you didn't have an HD screen, it wouldn't work, right? So it's, it's just a mode of investigation and hypothesis generation that we're just beginning to get into. The statistics is what we're missing, right? Now, let's go um, to, um, let's do my three different ones and then drop the healthy and we'll come back to that. You know, by the way, talking yeah. about calcium, it would be great if we can get a hold of this data and try to do some simple stuff like media instead of average. Sure, sure, sure. And then we can, be, try to answer the question you, you raised before about where the signal to noise threshold is. Yeah. Right? Well, Wyzong has these spreadsheets. We'll get you the right spreadsheet. So we can, we can work with okay, so Wyzong, that's a follow-up to yeah. get him a couple hundred thousand cells to play with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know what would be good, Wyzong, is actually to send him the one that has um, my three UC and the uh, and the uh, Crohn's, but also the 150 healthy. So it's not as deep a, a set of reads, but it's a much broader set. So we can give you both deeper reads, but then say only 35 people, or 150 people with say half the depth or something, because you may get different answers, right? Okay, so now what we're doing is comparing me at three different times. And again, you might have thought that this was a wonderful thought out experiment ahead of time. Um, this is every day I wake up and I say, uh, maybe it's time to go get a sample or something. You know, I mean, I have no clue what I'm doing. And, and I, 
And it's not like, well, like yesterday, like this last week, I had this really intense flare. So at the peak of the flare, I said, take a stool sample. And so actually I took like seven, well, about seven vials, but because people are getting, my stool's getting quite popular in different labs and whatnot, so forth. So. Um, okay, anyway, uh, but I do have a protocol that if I am about, if I am going to make a major change in uh, medicines or treatment or something, I take, so for, before I have a colonoscopy, two days before I flush myself, I take a stool sample and do a blood test. So I have a snapshot of what was I like before. In this case, um, once, you know, you got to put yourself back into the, where we were in January a year ago when I was in miserable shape and I had all my th numbers were through the roof. And, and so finally, remember May was when I got my, um, I switched over to Sanborn and he did the first colonoscopy. And uh, he took like 24 biopsies and he did all kinds of photographs and everything. And we sat down and he said, well, your looks to me like you, you've got Crohn's and we should think about therapy. And I said, okay, I don't want to do any therapy until I've tracked myself to see what the natural rhythm of my immune system is. And he says, okay, when you can't take any longer, come back and we'll talk. So in January, I came back and I said, okay. And I think I had another colonoscopy at that point. Um, and so he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you um, a month of Cipro and Flagol um, every day. And then we're going to start you off at 40 milligrams a day of prednisone. So suppress your immune system um, for two weeks. And then the, you know, take five away taper uh, for a month and a half. So this blue is the day after uh, I took my last prednisone. And a month after the end of taking the month of antibiotics. Um, and then this is four months later in green. So the idea is between these is the therapy. And then this is the natural rebound of the system four months later. Okay. Well, if you look at it, you can see that um, after the therapy, the um, bacteria, bacteriotes actually, or if anything, even more compressed. Um, the firmicutes were pretty much the same, except now, guess who's number one? The same as for healthy. And that one that was there before that was hundreds of times greater than it should have been is, uh, yeah, that one, is where? Right? So that's just what you hope to happen, right? If you come down here, you can see that um, the thing that I find oddest is E. coli was at 10.5%. After you've dosed it for a, a month with two heavy duty antibiotics, it's 11%. So you would have thought. I mean, most like people would think, if I got an E. coli infection, if I take antibiotics, that'll take care of it. However, I was very pleased that, first of all, you'll notice the actinobacteria is now much more prevalent than it was before. But the fusobacteria, let's link it up there, gone. Which, since it's the one that causes the colon cancer, I wouldn't say causes. It's the one that's correlated with the presence of colon cancer. Uh, it's gone and stays gone. Yeah. So can you show E. coli after? Yeah, here. And then after? Yeah. Yep. So basically it doesn't even matter. To, 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 to do significant digits. No, the other thing that's interesting about that is when you've done any sort of CPA, the E. coli clusters in differently than anyone else always. And it seems to be the strongest variable that we've seen in the sort of basic clustering analysis So in other words, including the Crohn's and the, and the ulcerative colitis. Now, 
what Y is doing is work, a very, very hard thing to do, but it's just, you'll understand why it's hard. Your E. coli is, what is it, John, seven million bases long or something like that, five million bases anyway, it's something like that. Yeah, five, five million. Okay, and your reads are a hundred. And there are a hundred strains of E. coli that we have the genomes for. Roughly 50% of those have the same core genome, and the other 50% of the genome varies, right? Well, that means two and a half million are the same across all 100, and you're trying to match it up with 100 bases at a time. So you haven't assembled, you're just trying to do it with, with the actual Illumina reads. So trying to figure out which strain you have is mathematically challenging, right? Not impossible, just challenging. He's also looked at, at, at doing uh, limited assembly to get contigs as long as, what, 10,000? Yeah, yeah, he can do, you know, like 1,000 up to 10,000 or something like that, which, as he says, helps you bridge, you know, bigger pieces, so you're more likely to differentiate, but if the simile correct, and right, and, and then also that the abundances are not going to be very accurate at that point, right? So, but what we're trying to do is look at the strain distribution. Now, if you take the things that he's done with the contigs and you just ask a simple binary question, look at the top 10 strains that are present in here, and then what do they look like for here and here? And the answer is they're completely gone. And if you ask what are those strains, most of them are the strains you find in Crohn's. So there's a number of famous like S88 and, and, and a number of these other E. coli strains that are known to be identified with Crohn's. Hello, Kevin. We're doing medicine. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> um, so this is Kevin Patrick, who's an MD, and the, as I was telling the, and Eugene Coker is here. He, so you two have something in common. If you've both been editors of important journals, he's, he was for 12 years uh, the editor of Omics, which started from the Institute of System Biology, and he's the editor-in-chief of American Journal of Preventive Medicine. And, um, <laughs> so Kevin, what we're just doing is I've been showing, going through what we're able to do now that we've got three epics of, uh, of my stool metagenomics. So what this is, is each of these is, a, have you seen this before? So each, each of these is a species, but they're divided by phyla. And what we're just pointing out is um, this one is after a month of antibiotics and, and two months of prednisone. And the, while the fusobacteria, which are correlated with uh, being found in colon cancer, and I had to start with, um, let's see, can we highlight the fusobacteria? So I had like 8% um, <laughs> and a healthy person has 0. 0.00001 or something like that. Um, the antibiotics completely, or I mean, it's a hypothesis that the antibiotics or the prednisone completely knocked it out. Um, and the methanogens, that's the next one over, the archae, notice that they went from 19% uh, to 0 0.003, so three tenths of a percent. So most of the archae were knocked out. Um, and the actinobacteria, which I'll come back to in a minute, were expanded quite a bit uh, in their coverage. Uh, but the E. coli was uh, essentially stayed at 10% in spite of a month of antibiotics. Now, what I was just getting at is, however, if you look within the strain distribution of, say, 50 to 100 strains of E. coli, it looks to me, and this is just very preliminary from Weizong's assembly work, it looks to me like the most pathogenic strains that are associated with being found in people with Crohn's 
with biopsies uh, disappeared. And a different set of presumably more commensal E. coli came back. On the other hand, I'm still at 150 times what you know you presumably have as a healthy person. And the results of E. coli strain, this you know commensal stayed after too, yeah. So basically, after drug, you know, you got this commensal not what you had before, right? Well, we don't know. That's this. This all we know at this point is a species level, okay. but we have in the spreadsheets. These are the 500,000 score. <laughs> we have that. Um, you can't see from here the strains. Uh, this is um, one year ago. This is December 28th of uh, 2011. This is um, April of 2012. And this is August of 2012. So they're four months apart. I've got. Uh, the samples in, in, uh, from December, four months after this one, and uh, they're not analyzed yet. But the main thing is, what I'm trying to do is just show what we're finding out you can tell by looking at this that has not been done before with doctors. Um, and in particular, what the impact of the antibiotics are. So I think if, if you, you know, you're a doctor, you prescribed antibiotics, right? Okay, I bet you never have sat down with your patient and said, let's say, hey, you know, we're going to try to kill some microbes. I wonder what your microbes were before I prescribed that antibiotic to you, and I wonder after I did it what they killed and what came back to grow because it's an ecological response, and that's what it really makes you think about is that this, you know, you're not pinpointing a particular species with its bacteriophage, which is where the next round is going to come from the designer, um, where you can just kill one species. Uh, you're, it's broad spectrum, so, you know, well, what does it do, right? Well, that's what we're finding out. I don't, we can't get that, can we? The actual grams per cubic centimeter, you mean? Yeah. Of, of bacteria? Yeah. Or numbers per yeah, cubic yeah, centimeter? Or, yeah, I don't know, John. Yeah, that's a good what, question. Well, now that's true, that between here and here, there was um, a colonoscopy, although it was in, uh, it was like a week after this, and sort of not since four months earlier than this. And the turnover for your bacteria is once a day. So I've had a hundred turnover times between the colonoscopy and, and, and this. Well, this is an answerable question because I can take a stool sample two days before I clean myself out and two days after the colonoscopy, or a day. I mean, that's the whole point. I'm just trying to generate what we ought to be doing as research, given that this is a that can now be obtained, which was never possible before. Oh, that's, let's do that. This is where it gets sort of psychedelic. Um, um, well, so Karen and I, along with Weizong and, and Shabu, and, um, want to publish an article on this, on the microbes. Um, but we're so busy writing grants, we don't get around to it. And then I want to write an article on the interaction of the immune system and the microbes. Um, but that'll be later this year sometime. Both will be later this year. Yeah, all this is unpublished. Um, although it's all of my PowerPoints that are published, so. 
uh, the the uh, what do you call it? The linear tool. Oh, oh, let's let's show just the three times. Okay. So what we're going to do now is um, each of these is there. Okay. So what we're doing is we're tracking um, the abundance. So remember the fusobacteria is like this, and then it went to this bottleneck here, and then it stayed. Here's the proteobacteria that stayed pretty much the same width as you went through it. Um, here's, a, here's another one. What's this one? So this is this particular form of, there was 5% of my firmicutes down to nothing, right? Um, over here, here's another wipeout. This is the one I was talking about. So this is my most abundant firmicute, <laughs> which is the most abundant phyla. Um, when I was at the height of my inflammation, 14% of my entire microbial abundance. And you can see it was completely wiped out after the therapy. Um, and um, anyway, so this is just another way. Here, you remember I said that the actinobacteria expanded, see, yeah, and then bottlenecked again. So this is a different way of doing it. Now let's go to bringing up me, December 28th, ulcerative colitis, um, Crohn's, and healthy. Okay, so what, what you're seeing here, the bottom one is healthy. This bar here is Crohn's. This is ulcerative colitis, and these are an average over like a dozen people, and then that's me. And, um, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of information in here. It's a little hard to read. Let's see, what is this purple area here? Okay, that's this one particular kind of uh, firmicute that's very prevalent in, in Crohn's. If you look here in ulcerative colitis, it's not there. Now, the thing that makes it very interesting is there's no molecular diagnostic that tells the difference between whether you have Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. But if you look at the difference in this bar and this bar, there's clearly a microbial ecology diagnostic. And I say clearly, it's still got to be verified. But I mean, there's at least a hypothesis there is. Let's, let's look at it again just with the bar graphs, because this is, I find, a little overwhelming. But um, there's just an enormous amount of information that you can detect here. You, can, you just look at it, and you obviously see what got smaller, what got bigger. Um, OK, good. So now here are, and this is, what are we at, 200? or? Yeah. So um, now look at this in terms of, of what I call the microbial ecology fingerprint for the disease type. So this is me, whatever that is. <laughs> this is ulcerative colitis, this is Crohn's, and this is uh, healthy. Um, well, uh, the first thing you can see is if you look at the uh, difference between healthy and and just take the bacteriotes, which is the most prominent phylum. So that's this one down here. In Crohn's, uh, it's even more compressed than in me, but not nearly as much in ulcerative colitis. This is in you see what I'm saying? So, so one of the characteristics of Crohn's is a complete wipeout of the bacteriotes. On the other hand, if you look at the actinobacteria down here, you can see that the characteristic, highlight the actinobacteria, um, the characteristic what I'm 
Yeah, so the phenotype. So I'm red. Yeah, it's just to separate. Out. Okay, so just highlight the actinobacteria. And, and what you can see right off is um, that the actinobacteria is very broad in Crohn's, uh, pretty compressed in UC and me. And I'm sort of intermediate between the two. Um, and you can get down as to what species are there and so forth. But then look at the proteobacteria. The proteobacteria in ulcerative colitis are wildly different than they are in Crohn's. Okay? And I'm, uh, again, in between the two. So what it is, I show characteristics of both. And if you compare it with a healthy person, um, you know, again, uh, we saw before the uh, proteobacteria are, are only 1% of the population. And up here, in ulcerative colitis, 28%. So 30 to 1. So it's not a small difference. Um, and again, now look at the fusobacteria. So I was telling you, that I wanted you to hear this, um, Kevin. So <clears throat> you'll notice that the fusobacteria are only really apparent in Crohn's, and I had a much worse case of it. If you look up where is fusobacteria, it's taken out of biopsies of colon cancer. And, and so Crohn's is known to lead, in many cases, to colon cancer. But I don't know that I've ever seen, you know, why, okay? Um, and fortunately, mine are now gone thanks to the therapy, which I don't think my doctor had any clue that that was a part of his, as, and by the way, I say that with all due respect because he's probably the best in the country, <laughs> um, and a clinical researcher for IBD. So anyway, these are the kind of hypotheses that you would like to follow up <clears throat> with, a, with a trial where you've got, for instance, people at different stages of Crohn's, including, say, colon cancer, uh, where you can actually look at the biopsies and begin to say, is this really a good marker or not? But, but do you have like, local champions on, on the top level of any possible thing? Because if you say in an ideal case, then Sanborn. Well, <clears throat> this is one of my great hopes for 2013. That we've finally gotten away from there goes crazy Larry with his stool in the refrigerator jokes to dozens of MDs sitting where you are over the last month or two and multiple NIH grants going out. However, in terms of a hospital, no. I'd have to say, not really. Yeah, yeah, I noticed. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's switch to the cave.